Hi, it's been a while since I made a video and I felt like I needed to answer a question that keeps coming up. And that question is, why can't you be gay in Scientology? And to answer that question, we're going to do a tiny bit of Scientology 101. The first thing that we're going to cover that answers this question is the tone scale. Okay. And there's a scale in Scientology, which uh, L. Ron Hubbard developed, which gives you every emotion or tone that you can be feeling at any given time. And in Scientology, anything to be considered survival or good for you exists on this scale. Any action or emotion or anything exists on this scale from 2.0 up. Okay. So any emotion or effort that you're making that is in any one of those emotions is for your survival. It's moving you forward. Anything below that is moving you towards death, towards total failure. And I want to hone in on a very specific tone, which is the 1.1 covert hostility tone. And as you can see on the chart, kind of gives a description of how Scientologists feel about 1.1 people. The most dangerous tone level of all is covert hostility. Well, I signed up for some fashion design classes. Really? Here is the person who smiles to your face and then stabs you in the back. I love you, sweetie. And I know that you have your own personal look. Their conversation is filled with small barbs. Designers have to have a lot of talent and not very many people make it. Because they're secretly trying to upset you or even destroy you without you being aware of it. Don't set your heart on it, okay? I don't want to see you get hurt. Now, if you go to another uh, reference here, the Hubbard chart of human evaluation, which also contains the tone scale. And this also breaks down every element of life and your abilities in, in various areas of life according to your tone. At the 1.1 level on this chart, we find covert hostility and they are deemed psychotic, okay? And if you go over to column P, which is the sexual behavior attitude towards children, L. Ron Hubbard states, you will have promiscuity, perversion, sadism, irregular practices. So what exactly does L. Ron Hubbard mean by perversion? If we go to the very first book that started it all, Dianetics, The Modern Science of Mental Health, and in it, L. Ron Hubbard says, the sexual pervert, and by this term in Dianetics, to be brief, includes any and all forms of deviation, such as homosexuality, lesbianism, sexual sadism, etc. The sexual pervert is actually quite ill physically. Perversion as an illness has so many manifestations that it must be spread through the entire gamut of classes. Overdevelopment of sexual organs, underdevelopment, seminal inhibition or magnification, etc. are found some in one pervert, some in another. And the sum of it is that the pervert is always a very ill person in one way or another, whether he's conscious of it or not. He is very far from culpable for his condition, but he's also so far from normal and so extremely dangerous to society that the tolerance of perversion is as thoroughly bad for society as punishment for it. I just want to repeat that last part again. He is so far from normal and so extremely dangerous to society that the tolerance of perversion is as thoroughly bad for society as punishment for it. So... In no uncertain terms, if you are gay, um, you are a pervert and you are not to be tolerated in society, according to L. Ron Hubbard. And in Scientology, the goal is to give you Scientology processing to bring you above 2.0 and push you forward to survival. So if you are gay, even though you're getting Scientology processing and you're in Proving in other areas of your life. You're able to communicate more. You're uh, happier in your life. You're feeling good about your career. If you remain gay, those things become invalidated and you remain at the 1.1 level. You never rise above it. You just stay down here at the 1.1 level because you're still a pervert. And let me just say this about growing up in Scientology and dealing with my own sexual identity. Um, I knew these things from a very early age, the tone scale and things like that. And knowing that being gay meant that you were chronically at the 1.1 level was terrifying to me as a child and as a young adult. I never wanted to be someone who was secretly seeking to harm everyone that I knew or, you know, plotting their doom 
or anything that I consider myself to be a loving, caring person. So the internal struggle for the feelings that I was feeling was far beyond the normal, you know, I'm not going to go to heaven um, or whatever other punishment was going to be there. There's a process in Scientology called false purpose rundown. And basically, in a nutshell, the process is to get rid of any evil thoughts that you have that are controlling your actions in life. And you do this by confessing transgressions of various different natures, whatever they ask you about. And then you go, you know, earlier and earlier and earlier transgressions until you find the very first time you committed that type of transgression. And just before that, according to L. Ron Hubbard, there will be an evil purpose that you formulated at that moment in order to make you carry out this chain of, you know, destruction that you have committed across your lifetime. And when I got assigned to the Rehabilitation Project Force, I was given a many hundreds of hours of false purpose rundown, specifically targeting my sexual identity and any acts that I had committed while engaging in any form of sex. And the hyper-reality in Scientology isn't just the sex act itself, um, is not just sex, okay? Everything that you do that involves another person or yourself um, is sex. So that any form of making out, just picture the scale in your mind, goes from holding hands all the way up to whatever you can imagine, okay? And when you're doing these confessionals, it's not like when you sit down in a Catholic church and you say, forgive me, Father, I've sinned. Um, you know, I had thoughts about having sex with someone other than my partner. And then he says, okay, do five Hail Marys and, you know, don't do it again. You're forgiven, blah, blah, whatever. When you're receiving these confessionals, you have to give illicit details of everything you've done or thought. So think about for a moment, um, being in love with someone who is the same sex as you, and you know this is forbidden, and you know that you're going to, you know, throw away your whole life and your career in Scientology, but you love this person. And now that you've been found out, you are now sent to a concentration camp where you live in a dorm with 35, maybe 50 other people in some cases on a triple bunk where you have a junior high size locker to keep all of your possessions in and you work 10 to 15 hours a day doing extremely hard manual labor. And five of those hours can be spent sitting across from someone who wants to now talk to you about every single thing you did with that person that you loved, that you touched, that you kissed, that you caressed, and you have to tell them in graphic detail every single thing that you did. But now, as you're telling it, it's not an act of love. It's not a moment of joy. It's something you did that's a crime. And so you are confessing your love for this person as a crime against humanity. And as you say these things for hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, over and over and over. I want you to imagine how you begin to feel about yourself, how you begin to see yourself as a human. And let me tell you, you begin to see a very disgusting person when you look in the mirror because you feel some way about someone and it's it's a it's a feeling of love and now that love is turned on its head and every positive emotion that you ever felt is now a crime and you begin to question what is love how how am i supposed to feel about myself and every time you think you're better and you don't feel those feelings anymore and they come back, you don't even need a person across from you to ask questions. You're already doing it in your own mind and telling yourself how terrible you are and how awful you are. And for me, that's pretty much what happened. 
And when I finally escaped from there, as some of you may know, if you watch my other videos, um, I escaped in a very dramatic way and I had no choice really because I tried to run. I tried to leave per the procedures that Scientology gives and they wouldn't let me leave. And they had me pretty much convinced that not only were the feelings that I had when I was in love with someone uh, were evil and uh, demented and perverted, but that I could not get better. I couldn't use Scientology counseling to become a better person. And so I attempted suicide. And fortunately for me, obviously it didn't work, but fortunately for me, that was too much for Scientology. And they, um, excuse me, they kicked me out because then I was, you know, a PR risk for them. They can't have people dropping dead in the middle of their hallways. So when I left, you'd think, oh, it's, you know, now I can be free. But unfortunately, I was still trapped very much in a mental prison that they had laid the traps for over those three years of being constantly hammered constantly reported on and told every emotion that I felt that was pure was twisted and evil and wrong. And even when I left, my family knew that I fell in love with my roommate and um, they didn't care. You know, I have a, I have a great family and they said, you know, be you, but I couldn't be me. Even though physically I wasn't trapped by them anymore, I was still very much mentally trapped by them. And so I decided, well, of course, my my big problem in life is that I'm a virgin and I was 26 years old and I hadn't had sex with a man. So that's clearly why I was, you know, attracted to women because I hadn't experienced that. And I ended up doing that with a very good friend of mine and we got married and we had two beautiful children. And I really thought, you know, everything was working out just dandy. Then four years ago, I started feeling things that I had felt a long time ago for basically my whole life. And I tried to shove it down. And then I decided, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to be me. Before I made my first video where I talked about this very, you know, in a lot of detail, I sat down with my husband and I came out to him and his response was, I want you to be happy. And that I can't even tell you how good that made me feel. But even despite that, it took me at least two more years to even be comfortable with myself in having the emotions that I was having. And this is why it's so important to me that the homophobia, if that's even a strong enough word, in Scientology doesn't get ignored because it's not just a shaming or uh, you can't do Scientology if you're gay kind of thing. They destroy people's lives. They destroy people's sanity. And they ruin everything. There are people who were in the same position as me, basically, very much closeted, very much suppressing everything that they felt inside, who didn't make it out because they did take their own lives. I am, I am grateful to be here and I can talk about this, but in no uncertain terms, and there should be no doubt in anyone's mind what L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology thinks of the LGBTQAI community. Um, you are not welcome there. They do not like you. Even if you spend your money there, even if you give them your time and sign that billionaire contract, it is laid out right here in Dianetics, okay? They may smile at you and they may tell you how much they appreciate you. They don't want you there. And behind your back, they're talking about what a disgusting pervert and human that you are. And in conclusion, that, my friends, is why you cannot be gay in Scientology. <laughs>